Legalism and the Qin Empire. We have seen how Chinese politics became more corrupt, cynical, and violent in the spring and autumn era, and especially in the period of warring states. While many philosophers of the schools of Confucius and Mozu called for ethical reforms, and Taoists let nature take its course or retreated into seclusion, others experimented with stricter laws and practical administration. One of the first of these was Guan Zheng, who advised Duke Kuan of Qi in the early 7th century BC. His life and the 4th century administrative reforms of the realists Shang Yang and Shen Bu Hai were discussed in previous lectures. Quan Zhu. About 302 BC, King Xuan of Qi founded a scholarly academy known as Qi Xia. An influential book named after Guan Zheng called the Quan Zhu was probably written around the middle of the 3rd century BC, supplemented over time, and edited into its final version by about 26 BC. Though so still often recommending the same virtues the Confucians emphasized, this work is considered a forerunner of legalism because of its practical political philosophy. In the Guanzu, agriculture and wealth are considered the basis of good behavior. The spirits and ancestors are to be venerated, and the four cardinal virtues are propriety, justice, integrity, and conscience. Successful government depends on following the hearts of the people. If the ruler can provide the people with prosperity and leisure, they will make sacrifices for their state. Punishment alone is not sufficient because if it becomes excessive, orders will not be carried out. Trusting those with virtue puts the state on a firm foundation. Cultivating grain, mulberry, hemp, and domestic animals supplies the storehouses. Employing those with skill, giving orders that accord with the will of the people, using stern punishments and consistent rewards, and not cheating the people lead to good government. Those who govern should be impartial, like heaven and earth, the sun and the moon. Walls and armed forces are not enough to meet the enemy, and vast territory and abundant wealth will not hold the masses unless the way is followed. These scholars recommended that anyone who would question the present should investigate the past, and one can understand what is to come by, under, by studying what has gone before. To control the state, one must be careful how one uses the people. The sovereign can instruct the people with wisdom and propriety, but must also set an example and see that expenditures are proper while excesses are avoided. Laws establish the authority of the government and make use of the people's strength and ability. Serious attention must be paid to the granting of offices, their rewards, and to punishments. Collective responsibility for crime extends from the members to the head of the family, from them to group leaders, then to clan elders, the village commandant, sub-district prefects, the district governor, and finally to the chief justice. Rewards were similarly applied giving authority figures strong incentives to influence those under them. The Guanzi criticized such Moist ideas as abolishing the use of arms and universal love out of fear that the troops would not fight. The art of warfare is discussed commending speed, lightness of equipment, well-organized forces, destruction of enemy fields, well-paid spies, and prohibition of unorthodox doctrines. As usual, military morality violates universal ethical principles. Yet, in the model guidelines, the prince is urged to conform to the will of heaven in initiating affairs of state. This is interpreted as not bestowing favors on those close to him, nor disdaining those far away. The prince is warned not to reward just because he is pleased or kill because he is angry. For if his orders are capricious, they will not be carried out, and the people will turn to outsiders. Pragmatically, this work suggests examining the results when promoting what one thinks is good and counting the cost when one rejects what one dislikes. The prince should encourage those he respects, provide salaries for those with merit, 
and honor those who achieve success. Here, spreading universal love is considered spreading the princely mind. The people can be influenced in a moral way by caring for them with kindness, humanity, justice, goodness, faithfulness, and propriety. They can be harmonized with music, limited with time, tested with words, sent forth with strength, and overawed with sincerity. However, one who is incompetent in government has barren fields, empty towns, offices in disarray, laws ignored, empty granaries, and full jails. The worthy withdraw, while the wicked advance. Officials esteem flattery and look down on honesty. Citizens honor profit-seeking and despise martial courage. They love drinking and eating, but abhor agricultural labor. The result will be exhaustion of fiscal resources and lack of food. Such a ruler is extremely severe and demanding, while the officials are disobedient and destructive, resulting in discord. Benevolent government opens up fields, regulates shops, cultivates horticulture, exhorts the citizenry, encourages farming, repairs the walls and buildings, and circulates wealth by developing hidden resources, building roads, making markets convenient, and providing travel lodgings. Government is liberalized by easing exactions, lightening levies, relaxing punishments, pardoning crimes, and forgiving minor errors. The people are assisted by being compassionate to orphans, the widowed, the sick, and the unfortunate. They are further aided in distress by clothing the freezing, feeding the starving, assisting the poor, and comforting the upset. Benevolent government can then lead to just conduct and propriety, resulting in respect. Heaven serves with its seasons, earth with its natural resources, spirits with their omens, and animals with their strength. But humans serve with their virtue. The Guanza notes that nothing destroys goods, impoverishes the people, endangers the country, or causes the ruler concern more than the armed forces. But from the ancient times, no one has been able to dispense with them. Princes who are violent and reckless cannot avoid external disorders. But princes who are weak and irres irresolute cannot avoid internal disorders. Finally, Kwanzaa advises us that the enlightened kings govern by being cautious and making the people happy. Quote, the best thing is to criticize oneself. Then the people will not have to criticize. The people will criticize those who are unable to criticize themselves. Therefore, being able to judge one's own mistakes represents strength. Cultivating one's moral integrity represents wisdom. Not blaming evil on others represents goodness. Therefore, when the enlightened kings made mistakes, they took the blame themselves. When they did well, they gave credit to the people. When there are mistakes and one takes the blame oneself, one becomes cautious. When things are done well and credit is given to the people, they are happy. Book of Lord Shang. At the same time, the book named after Quanzun, Quan Chun was circulating in the 3rd century, there was another legalist tract going around attributed to the 4th century Chancellor of Qin, Shang Yang, called the Book of Lord Shang. It begins with a discussion led by Duke Xiao with three great officers on the world's affairs. The Duke wants to alter the laws but is afraid of being criticized by the people. Believing that the people's thoughts do not matter at the beginning, but they may rejoice in the completion, Shang Yang says, the law is an expression of love for the people. He believes the wise do not model themselves on antiquity nor adhere to established rights if they can benefit the people. The wise create laws, but the foolish are controlled by them. The great emperors and kings of the past did not copy one another, but acted according to practical requirements. Thus, according to Shang Yang's advice, the Duke decided to bring the wastelands under cultivation. In order to strengthen the country, Shang Yang believed that everyone's efforts should be devoted to agriculture and war. A strict legalist, Shang Yang's book is definitely anti-Confucian, 
as seen by the beginning of the section on discussion about the people. Sophistry and cleverness are an aid to lawlessness. Rites and music are symptoms of dissipations and license. Kindness and benevolence are the foster mother of transgressions. Employment and promotion are opportunities for the rapacity of the wicked. These eight things would make the people stronger than the government and the state weak. Shang Yong wanted the government to be stronger than the people so that the army will be strong and the state can attain supremacy. If the officials are virtuous, people will love their relatives. But if officials are wicked, people will love the statutes and spy on others so that crimes will be punished. Thus, this book actually ur argues against the virtue and the strength of the people, but for a strong government and army. The poor should be urged to work by rewards, and the rich should be punished so that they will not be parasites. Private rewards to those below should be forbidden so that the people will fight forcibly against the enemy. In the best ordered state, the laws are clear and the judgments are made by the families. In a merely strong state, judgments are made by the officials. And in a weak and disordered state, judgments are made by the prince. Shang Yang's book recommends statistical methods in cultivating the grasslands and making uniform rewards for soldiers. Orderly government is to be thought brought about by law, good faith, and correct standards. When rights and duties are clearly established by law, self-interest will not do harm. The Book of Lord Shang criticizes contemporary states that are disorderly because of private benefits going to those in office. Bad ministers let their standards be influenced by money in order to obtain emoluments. When the ministers compete with each other in selfishness and neglect the people, inferiors are estranged from superiors, dividing the state. States are in disorder because the law is not applied. Crimes are committed because their perpetrators are not caught. This book argues that if punishments are too light, crime cannot be eradicated, but that when punishments are heavy, people will not dare to do wrong. Then everyone will be virtuous without rewarding the virtuous. Rewarding the virtuous is not permissible because it is like giving rewards for not stealing. The good may be good towards others, but cannot cause others to be good. They may love others, but cannot cause others to love. Thus, goodness is not sufficient for governing the empire. The wise insist on good faith and have a method, law, by which the whole empire can be compelled to have good faith. Thus, when law is correctly administered, the result will be virtue. The legalist argues that if a condition can be brought about where there is no other standard than the law, then the clever will be unable to do wrong. If people are controlled by law and if promotions are rewarded by following systematic rules, then they will not be able to benefit each other with praise nor harm each other with slander. Then they will become accustomed to loving each other without flattery and hating each other without injuring each other thus purifying love and hatred and producing the highest degree of order. Some of these principles of law are commendable, in my opinion, but the accompanying ideas of control by harsh punishments and that people should not be allowed to exert their capabilities in anything other than farming or war are abominable. Han Feitzu. Unlike the other great Chinese philosophers of this era, Lao Tzu, Confucius, Mozi, Mencius, Zhuangzi, and Shinzi, who were impoverished noblemen, Han Feitzi was a prince of the royal family in the state of Han. He was born around 280 BC and studied under the Confucian realist Shinzi at the Ji Xia Academy along with Li Su, who considered Han the better student, according to Summa Qian's biography. Since he was not a good speaker, Han Fei it submitted his writings to the rulers of Han. The king of Han, however, did not apply them, but Han Fei continued to complain that ambitious scholars and militarists were given prominence over honest gentlemen. Eventually, the writings of Han Fei came to the attention of the young king of Qin, who began ruling in 246 BC 
and went on to become the founding emperor of the Qin dynasty, Shi Wang Di. His prime minister was Han Fei's old friend, Li Su, who informed his sovereign these writings were Han Fei's. In 234 BC, Qin attacked the state of Han, and their king An sent Han Fei as his envoy to Qin. The king of Qin was delighted to meet the philosopher, but Li Su warned the king that Han Fei was of the royal family of Han and likely to remain loyal to that state and therefore be against Qin. Charges were brought against Han Fei, who wanted to plead his case before the king, but he was not allowed an audience. So Han Fei sent a written memorial in which he acknowledged the perpendicular alliance formed from a north-south line of countries against the western power of Qin, but argued that they were weak and likely to run away in a confrontation because they have no faith in rewards and punishments. In contrast, the people of Qin respect courageous death and it is a much more powerful country. Nevertheless, Qin has not yet gained hegemony because its counselors are not loyal. Han Fei suggested that Qin could conquer the powerful Chu in the south and Qi and Yan in the east, as well as the three states of Zhao, Han, and Wei, which had formed out of Jin. He recounts several times in history when Qin lost its opportunity to gain this hegemony. Han Fei declares that if his advice is followed and Qin does not gain hegemony, then the king may behead him as a warning to others. In another memorial, Han Fei urged the king of Qin to treat Han as a loyal ally rather than an enemy so that the perpendicular alliance will not be mobilized against him. However, Li Su argued against this theory to the king and sent poison to Han Fei in prison. Han Fei, unable to communicate with the king, drank it and died in 233 BC. Although the king regretted his decision and pardoned Han Fei, it was too late. Han Fei Tzu is the main representative of the school of philosophy called Fa Jia, the legalists or realists. He drew the concept of law, Fa, from the book of Lord Shang, and the idea of administration, Shu, from the writings of Shen Bu Hai. From the logicians, he borrowed the theory of forms and names, Xing Ming, which he applied to politics as a correspondence between administrators' words and job descriptions and their actual functioning in practice. Han Fei Tzu was also very much influenced by Taoism, making a strange combination of legalistic authoritarianism and passive acceptance. His essay on the way of the ruler shows his, this relationship. It begins, The way is the beginning of all beings and the measure of right and wrong. Therefore, the enlightened ruler holds fast to the beginning in order to understand the wellspring of all beings and minds the measure in order to know the source of good and bad. He waits, empty and still, letting names define themselves and affairs reach their own settlement. Being empty, he can comprehend the true aspect of folks. Being still, he can correct the mover. Those whose duty it is to speak will come forward to name themselves. Those whose duty it is to act will produce results. When names and realities match, the ruler need do nothing more, and the true aspect of all things will be revealed. Hence it is said, the ruler must not reveal his desires, for if he reveals his desires, his ministers will put on the mask that pleases him. Anfetsa does not want the ruler to be manipulated by his ministers, which is why he advises the sovereign not to reveal his will or express his likes and dislikes. The wise ruler does not expose his wisdom, but has everyone know their place, does not display his worth, but observes the motives of the ministers, and does not flaunt bravery in shows of indignation, but allows subordinates to demonstrate their valor. The officials have their regular duties and each is employed according to specific ability. The ruler practices inaction, but the ministers below tremble in fear. The inferior ruler uses his own ability. The average ruler uses the people's strength 
and the best ruler uses the people's wisdom. The ruler takes credit for accomplishments but holds ministers responsible for their errors. The ministers labor and display wisdom, but the ruler is their corrector and maintains an untarnished reputation. The ruler should know, but not let it be known that he knows. Each person's words are to be compared with their results. Officials should not know what others are doing. No one must be allowed to covet his power in this authoritarian regime. The ruler uses the two handles of rewards and punishments to control others and examines results to see how they match his objectives. The ruler is to be immeasurably great and unfathomably deep, while any attempt of ministers to form cliques is to be smashed. Thus, ministers should not be allowed to shut out the ruler, nor control the wealth of the state, nor issue their own orders, nor do good deeds in their own name, nor build up cliques, so that the ruler will not lose effectiveness, the means of dispensing bounties and command, his reputation for enlightenment, and his support. The way of the ruler is to observe calmly what others say and do without speaking or doing himself. He notes proposals and examines their results. He assigns tasks to ministers according to what they say and the accomplishments that result. Those whose deeds match their words are rewarded, and when things do not match, they are punished. These rewards and punishments must be dispensed objectively, so that even those close to the ruler may be punished, and those far away can be sure of reward. Thus, all will have to make effort, and none can be too proud. Nevertheless, for Han Feitze, what transcends even the ruler is the law. On having standards, explains that an enlightened ruler uses the law to select officials by weighing their merits without attempting to judge them himself. True worth will not remain hidden, and faults will not be glossed over. Praise will not help some advance, nor will calumny drive others from the court. Ministers are to be like the hands and feet of the ruler, not presuming to use their mouths to speak for a private advantage or their eyes to look for private gain. Even the ruler must never use wise ministers and able servants for selfish ends so that the government can be consistent and good. Hanfeza disdained those who leave their posts to search for another sovereign or who controvert the law with false doctrines or censure their sovereign or who try to gain a name for themselves by doing, doling out charity or even those who withdraw from the world and criticize their superiors or who seek favorable relations with other states in order to make themselves indispensable in a crisis. If the ruler tries to monitor the government with his own eyes, ears, and mind, he can be manipulated by what is presented to him. Thus, the ancient kings relied on law and policy to make sure that rewards and punishments were correctly implemented. Then even clever speakers could not deceive them. Authority and power should never be in more than one place, or else abuse will become rife. If law is not respected, all the ruler's actions will be endangered. If penalties are not enforced, evil cannot be overcome. Even the highest minister must not be allowed to escape punishment, nor should the lowest peasant's reward be skipped. Thus those in high positions will not abuse the humble. If laws are clearly defined, superiors will be honored and rights will not be invaded. Hanfeza warned the ruler against eight villainies. Though a ruler may share his bed with beauties, he should not listen to their special pleas. He should hold attendants personally responsible for their words and not allow them to speak out of turn. He should not allow kin and elder statesmen to escape appropriate punishment nor advance them arbitrarily. Buildings may be constructed to delight the ruler, but officials should not be allowed to use them to ingratiate themselves. Orders for doling out charity in time of need must never come from ministers but from the ruler. The true abilities of those who are flattered must be determined, likewise the faults of those who are denounced. 
Military heroes should not be given unduly large rewards, and those who take up arms in a private quarrel must never be pardoned. Officials must not be allowed to have their own soldiers, and requests of feudal lords should be granted if they are lawful, but rejected if they are not. In the essay, Ten Faults, Anfetsu listed them briefly and then gives numerous historical examples of each one. The list is as follows. One, to practice petty loyalty and thereby betray a larger loyalty. Two, to fix your eye on a petty gain and thereby lose a larger one. Three, to behave in a base and willful manner and show no courtesy to the other feudal lords, thereby bringing about your own downfall. Four, to give no ear to government affairs, but long only for the sound of music, thereby plunging yourself into distress. Five, to be greedy, perverse, and too fond of profit, thereby opening the way to the destruction of the state and your own demise. Six, to become infatuated with women musicians and disregard state affairs, thereby inviting the disaster of national destruction. Seven, to leave the palace for distant travels, despising the remonstrances of your ministers, which leads to grave peril for yourself. Eight, to fail to heed your loyal ministers when you are at fault, insisting upon having your own way, which will in time destroy your good reputation and make you a laughingstock of others. Nine, to take no account of internal strength, but rely solely upon your allies abroad, which places the state in grave danger of dismemberment. Ten, to insult big powers even though your state is small and fail to learn from the remonstrances of your ministers, acts which lead to the downfall of your line. Hanfeza also wrote on the difficulties of persuading a ruler. This requires more than general knowledge and the ability to express oneself well. The most difficult part is to know the mind of the person one is trying to persuade so that fitting words can be used. One does not talk about profit to one who is seeking a reputation for virtue. And if one is talking to someone who wants profit, it is useless to talk about virtue. If the person secretly wants gain but claims to be virtuous and you talk about virtue, he will pretend to listen but ignore you. If you talk about profit, he will appear to reject your advice, but secretly follow it. Anfeta also discussed many other complicated situations, many of them quite dangerous for the advisor because of the insecurity of the sovereign. He concluded that it is not difficult to know something. The difficulty is in knowing how to use what one knows. For Anfeta, the wise governs by rectifying laws clearly and establishing severe penalties in order to prevent the strong from exploiting the weak and the many from oppressing the few, to enable the old and infirm to die in peace and the young and orphans to grow freely, to make sure frontiers are not invaded, the ruler and minister are in intimate terms, fathers and sons support each other, and people do not worry about being killed in war or taken prisoner. He believed that stupid people want order, but dislike the true path to order, which he considered to be the severe penalties, even though they are hated by people. Mercy and pity are welcomed by the people, but Hanfetsu believed they endanger the state. Although he acknowledged that the legalist who makes laws in the state acts contrary to prevailing public opinion, he nevertheless believed that this is in accord with the way, justice, and virtue. In Precautions Within the Palace, Hanfetsu wrote that it is dangerous for the ruler to trust others, for whoever trusts others will be controlled by them. Ministers who have no blood bonds with their ruler, and they never stop trying to spy into the sovereign's mind. Thus many rulers are intimidated, and some are even murdered. If the ruler trusts his son or his consorts, evil ministers may find ways to use them for their private schemes. The ruler must make sure that no one receives unearned rewards nor oversteps their authority. Death penalties must be executed and no crime must go unpunished. 
However, if too much compulsory labor is demanded of people, they will feel afflicted and join local power groups. Local power groups then work to exempt people from labor service, which enables their leaders to grow rich in bribes. Thus, the rulers should keep labor services minimal so that the power groups will disappear, and all favors will come from the sovereign. Anfetsu was afraid that if the ruler lends even a little of his power to others, the superior and inferior will change places. Thus, no ministers should be allowed to borrow the power and authority of the ruler. According to Han Feitsu, the ruler should be so strict that if what a minister says beforehand does not tally with what he says or does later, he must be punished even though he may have fulfilled his task with distinction. This, he believed, will keep the subordinates responsible. Han Feitsu held that the ruler must be strict enough to put these theories into practice even though it means going against the will of the people. He noted how Lord Shang had to be guarded with iron spears and heavy shields, and eventually the people of Qin tore apart his body with two chariots. When Guan Chung first instituted his reforms in Qi, Du Kuan had to ride in an armored carriage. Writing on pretensions and heresies, Han Feitze argued that it is the duty of the sovereign to establish the laws and standards of right and distinguish these from private interests. Most ministers want to exalt their private wisdom, but if they condemn the law as wrong, their creeds must be regarded as heresy and suppressed. The ruler must forbid private favors and enforce what is ordered. Yet the private virtue of ministers is to practice personal faith with friends and not be encouraged by reward or discouraged by punishment. This, Han Feitsu believed, leads to disorder. But where public virtue is practiced, there is order. Though ministers have selfish motives, their public duty is to obey orders and behave unselfishly in office. Thus, ministers must use their calculating minds to put aside selfish motives and serve the ruler. The ruler also calculates how to protect the state from injury by private interests and uses rewards and penalties to overawe them. The commentaries on the teachings of Lao Tzu in the Han Feitsu may have been by his followers in an era when legalism was trying to survive by merging with Taoism. Some of the interpretations become rather absurd as when compassion is extended to military victory and defense in order to be compassionate to one's soldiers. What about the enemies? And even more absurdly, to the weapons themselves. What could be more perverted than that? When Han Feitz's sage king makes laws, the rewards must be enough to encourage the good and his authority strong enough to subjugate the violent. His preparation must be sufficient to accomplish his task. In this system, the good live on and flourish while the bad fade away and die. If the pronouncements of the sovereign are clear and easy to understand, his promises can be kept. If the laws are easy to be observed, his orders will be effective. If the superiors are not self-seeking, the inferiors will obey the law. Hanfeza also recommended seven tactics to the sovereign and then gave historical examples of how they work. The first is to compare and inspect all available and different theories. Second, punishments must be definite and authority clear. Third, rewards are to be bestowed faithfully and everyone is to exercise their abilities. Fourth, the ruler should listen to all sides of every story and hold speakers responsible for their words. So far, these are clear and straightforward. But the last three use deception and manipulation to enhance the power of the ruler. The fifth is to issue spurious edicts and pretend to make certain appointments. Sixth, one may inquire into cases by manipulating different information. And seventh, words may be inverted and tasks reversed. Ostensibly, the purpose of the last three is to help the ruler find out the truth by using indirect methods but the lack of integrity and damage to credibility certainly makes them questionable for the long term. Hanfeitze argued that people can be deterred from even small crimes by serious penalties, and then they will not commit major crimes at all. Thus, he hoped that a strong government will not allow any serious crimes. 
Yet the problem is that criminals are not always caught, no matter how vigilant the government may be. He noted that the gold diggers in the South could not be stopped from stealing gold dust, even though some were caught and stoned to death in the marketplace, and there is no chastisement more severe than that. Duke Jing once asked a poor man about the prices in the market. Yen Zhe replied that ordinary shoes are cheap, but the shoes for the footless are expensive. Duke Jing, who had been busy inflicting many punishments, cutting off feet, was embarrassed. Thinking he was too cruel, he abolished five laws of the criminal code. Yet, he was criticized by Han Feitsu, who argued that loosening censure and giving pardons benefit the crooks and injure the good, and thus do not lead to political order. Han Feitsu did not consider personnel administration easy, but the ruler must regulate officials with rules and measures, and then compare their actions with their words. Projects that are lawful should be carried out. Those that are not should be stopped. Results matching proposals should be rewarded. Those not producing corresponding results should be punished. Hanfetsu believed that only about one person out of a hundred would act correctly, simply out of virtue. But everyone loves profit and dislikes injury. Thus, effective government cannot rely on virtue. He believed that if the punishment for desertion is heavy, no one will run away from the enemy. Hanfetsu criticized those who believed that heavy penalties injure the people and are unnecessary because light penalties can be used. He argued that heavy penalties are more likely to deter than light ones, and therefore they can prevent all crime. I believe the error in his logic is that he incorrectly generalizes that heavy penalties will stop all crimes, which is not the case. He notes that people often trip on anthills, but no one stumbles over a mountain. He argues that people will either ignore light penalties or trip on them like traps. This may be true, but may not using heavy penalties like mountains lead to a monstrous society. Hanfetsu described five kinds of customs as vermin, which he felt caused a disordered state. Scholars who praise ancient kings for their virtue put on a fair appearance but cast doubt on the laws of the time and confuse the ruler. Persuaders present false schemes and borrow influence from abroad to further their private interests but injure the welfare of the state's land and grain. Heroic swordsmen gather bands of followers and violate the government's prohibitions. Courtiers gather in private homes and bribe influential men to get out of military service. Finally, artisans and merchants make and collect useless articles and luxuries, accumulating wealth, cornering markets, and exploiting farmers. On face have pointed out, that even the wise Confucius was subordinate to Duke I of Lu because of his authority. He realistically argued that the people and even kings are not able to rise to the goodness and justice of a Confucius who could convince only 70 followers. Rather, the enlightened ruler should make punishments certain as well as severe so that people will fear them. Rewards should be generous and consistent so that people will seek them. The best laws are uniform and inflexible so that people understand them. Rewards must not be delayed, nor should mercy deflect the administering of punishment. Praise accompanying the reward and censure following the punishment both stimulate people to do their best. The wise ruler takes into consideration the scarcity or plenty of the time. Punishments may need to be light, but not because of compassion while severe penalties are not imposed because the ruler is cruel, circumstances change, and the ways of dealing with them must also change. Here, Han Feitze showed some flexibility, but still did not waver from his calculated policy. One method Han Feitze recommended for making rewards and punishments more effective was to have people watch each other and be responsible for reporting crimes in their community. By rewarding those who denounce criminals and punishing those who refuse to do so as complicit, he hoped that all kinds of culprits would be detected. However, this innovation, which was actually a regression to primitive times, 
was implemented by Lord Shang in Qin in the 4th century BC, was one of the main reasons he was so unpopular and led to his death. Han Feitze coldly and calculatingly suggested methods of behavioral modification as political theory under an authoritarian system of monarchy. He brought these to the attention of the leaders in the powerful state of Qin, where he became the first casualty in a policy that allows no one to challenge the authority of the ruler. Next, we shall examine what happened when Qin implemented these ideas in its conquest of China. Qin Empire. In 221 BC, when Qin took over the last of the other six states, Qi, King Zheng's first official act was to declare himself first august emperor, Shi Wang Di, of what we still call China from the name of his state of Qin. He abolished the traditional practice of having posthumous names assigned by one's successor and expected his successors to be called august emperor of the second generation and third on down to 1,000 and 10,000 generations. But ironically, his dynasty was to end about four years after his own death. According to current cosmology, the element water was to succeed the fire of the Zhou dynasty. And so the first emperor adopted the corresponding characteristics of water, such as the color black, the number six, and the harsh punishments of strict laws as indicated by the season winter. For this reason, he refused to pardon any crimes the chancellor suggested that feudal kings be set up in each region as the Zhou dynasty had done. But the commandant of justice, Li Su, argued that the Son of Heaven had been unable to control feudal rulers. Since the power of the new emperor had united all the civilized areas between the seas, they should be made into provinces and districts in the usual Qin administration. The emperor agreed with this hoping that the unending warfare of the kings and marquises would thus be pacified by his sole rule. So the empire was divided into 36 provinces, each with a governor, military commandant, and superintendent. Weapons from all over the empire were confiscated and brought to the capital at Xianyang, where they were melted down and cast into bells and statues of 12 giants weighing 29 tons each. All weights and measures were standardized, as was the writing system. According to the historian Su Ma Qian, 120,000 rich and powerful families from all over the empire were moved to the capital. Replicas of the palaces of the conquered states were reconstructed near Xianyang. Extensive mansions with elevated walks and fenced pavilions were filled with beautiful women and treasure from the feudal states. Broad highways were built lined with trees. The emperor traveled and erected stone markers with inscriptions praising his accomplishments and claiming that all is gauged by law and pattern. He exalted agriculture and abolished lesser occupations. The edicts proclaim that evil and wrongdoing are no longer permitted, so everyone practices goodness and integrity. When the emperor had difficulty crossing a river because of winds, he ordered 3,000 convict laborers to cut down all the trees on the mountain of the offending goddess. In 218 BC, when an attempted assassination failed, he ordered a search of the entire empire for 10 days. Further inscriptions claim that he captured the kings of the six states, united all under heaven, ended harm and disaster, and then laid aside his arms for all time. He orders the whole universe and has established justice and his honored office holders so understand their duties that everything proceeds without ill feeling or doubt. The emperor had local walls and fortifications torn down, waterways improved, and canals built. He claimed that when the land was fixed, the masses were freed from their forced labor. But in fact, for 10 years, an army of 300,000 under General Ming Tian was not only fighting the barbarians in the north, but also building the Great Wall to defend the empire. In 214 BC, thousands of men who had run away from conscription or evaded taxes were sent to invade Lu Liang. 
Convicts were sent to populate new con newly conquered territories. One day in 213 BC, when the emperor was entertaining 70 scholars with wine, one of them complained that the sons and brothers of the emperor are commoners, and that if anyone threatened him, he would not be able to respond, because the emperor had gone against the ancient tradition. The emperor asked for a discussion, and the chancellor, Li Su, replied that the greatest emperors did not imitate each other. He criticized past feudal strife and praised the emperor's unified rule. Li Su then complained that scholars study antiquity and criticize their own age to mislead and confuse the people. This discussion of the emperor's laws cause, causes problems and should be prohibited. Li Su therefore recommended that all historical records other than the Chins be burned. Anyone other than proved academicians with literature or writings of the philosophers must turn them in to be burned within 30 days or be subjected to tattoo and walled on labor. Books on medicine, divination, agriculture, and forestry were exempt, apparently because they were considered of practical value but they could only be studied under the tutelage of a law official. Furthermore, anyone who used antiquity to criticize the present was to be executed along with his family. The next year, the emperor felt his palace at Xianyang was too small, so he ordered the building of an immense palace at Apong that was connected to the Xianyang Palace by an elevated walk across the Wei River. 700,000 people condemned to castration and convict labor were called up for this project and to build the emperor's secret mausoleum at Mount Li, where 30,000 households were transported. All 270 palaces in the Xianyang area were connected by elevated walks and walled roads. Anyone revealing where the emperor was visiting at the moment was put to death. Once the emperor happened to notice the large number of carriages and attendants of the chancellor, a eunuch reported this to Li Su, who reduced the number of his carriages. But the emperor was so outraged by the leak of information that he had all those eunuchs who attended him that day executed, since none confessed. Two advisors, noting the increasing arrogance of the emperor and the futility of anyone trying to give him advice on pain of death, fled in secret. This led to an investigation of all the scholars in the capital and the execution of 460. Meanwhile, increasing numbers of convicts were being transported to the border regions. When the oldest son, Fusu, tried to remonstrate with the emperor, he was sent to supervise the activities of General Meng Tian in the north. In 211 BC, a meteor landed, and someone inscribed on the stone the first emperor will die and his land will be divided. Failing to find the author, the emperor had everyone in the area put to death and the stone pulverized. The next year, the emperor went on tour with Li Su and his youngest son, Hu Hai, accompanying him. The magicians put off the emperor, who was intent on finding the herb of immortality, by saying a large fish prevented them from getting to the island of immortality. The emperor dreamed that he was struggling with an ocean god and later shot a huge fish himself with his crossbow. Shortly after that, he fell ill. When his condition became grave, he wrote a letter under the imperial seal to his son Fusu telling him to carry out the burial in the capital. The letter was sealed and given to Zhao Gao, the eunuch in charge of the seals but it had not yet been entrusted to a messenger when the emperor died at Sand Hill. Only Prince Hu Hai, Chancellor Li Su, Zhao Gao, and five or six trusted eunuchs knew of the first emperor's death. Since they were far from the capital and no heir had been designated, Li Su kept it a secret and put the body in a closed carriage where imperial government continued. Zhao Gao, who had kept a letter to Fu Su and was Hu Hai's tutor, went to the latter and persuaded him to go along with what he knew was not virtuous. Hu Hai reluctantly agreed to let Zhao Gao consult with Chancellor Li Su. And after a long discussion of Li Su's opposing prospects, 
he too agreed to Zhao Gao's proposal. Thus, the three plotted together. Pretending they received an edict from the first emperor making Hu Hai the successor, they forged a letter to the elder son Fu Su, accusing him and General Meng Tian of many things and suggesting that they commit suicide. Receiving the letter, Fu Su wept and prepared to take his life, but Meng Tian recommended waiting for confirmation. At the messenger's insistent urging, the prince committed suicide, and Meng Tian, who refused to do so, was imprisoned. As the emperor's corpse was being returned to the capital, surrounding carriages were loaded with fish to disguise the smell. The body of the first emperor was interred in the immense mausoleum at Mount Li, along with the women in his harem who bore no sons and the artisans who knew about the secret tomb. The second emperor was 21 years old and entrusted the handling of state affairs to Zhao Gao, who urged him to make the laws sterner and the penalties more severe and extended to accomplices and families so that the chief ministers who sow dissension could be wiped out and the former emperor's officials be replaced by those who could be trusted by the new emperor. Meng Qian was forced to take poison, and his younger brothers, some of the chief ministers, and six or twelve princes were executed in the marketplace of Xianyang. All their wealth was confiscated by the state. Construction work on the Apong Palace and roads resumed so that taxes and levies on labor became increasingly heavy. 50,000 crossbowmen were brought to the capital from all over the empire, and for them and their dogs, horses, and other animals, food had to be shipped in from surrounding areas, increasing hardships. In the late summer of 209 BC, a former laborer named Chen She, who was in charge of transporting 900 convicts to a penitentiary settlement, was delayed by rain from arriving on time. Knowing that his penalty for tardiness would be death, he started a rebellion and declared himself king of Chu. Using plow handles and sticks, they rampaged over the empire. Numerous young men calling themselves the magnifiers of Chu murdered provincial Qin officials and set themselves up as marquees and kings, joined forces, and planned to attack Qin. When an official returning from the area reported the rebellion, the enraged emperor ordered him punished. After that, envoys, when questioned, replied that it was just a bunch of bandits who would soon be captured. This pleased the emperor. Li Su tried to remonstrate with the emperor, but he would not listen to him. The emperor said that to work hard all the time like past emperors mentioned in Han Feitz's Five Vermin was to be a slave when his sole concern should be to gratify himself. Li Su's son was governor of a province the rebels had invaded and he had not been able to stop them. By winter, a rebel army of several hundred thousand was approaching the capital. But General Zhang Han, using a force of convicts pardoned and released from working on the emperor's monument, forced the rebels to retreat to the east, where Chen She was assassinated by his charioteer. However, by now, the rebellion was widespread. Li Su was reprimanded for allowing such outbreaks of bandits. So he wrote a scholarly reply to the emperor in which he quoted from Shen Buhai and Han Feizu, arguing that if the techniques of supervision and reprimand are correctly applied, one cannot fail. Pleased, the emperor increased the severity of the supervising and reprimanding activities. Those officials who squeezed the most taxes out of people were admired as were those who put the largest numbers of people to death. Zhao Gao convinced the emperor that he should not expose his shortcomings before the chief ministers in court, but rather make decisions in the inner recesses of the palace, where he himself and a few other attendants could wait upon him. Soon, all decisions were being made by Zhao Gao. This powerful eunuch then went to Li Su and asked him to remonstrate with the emperor. Li Su said he would, but could not see the emperor because he was hidden away. Zhao Gao offered to tell Li Su when was a good time to request an interview, but instead he told him the times when the emperor was relaxing and did not want to be disturbed. Already perturbed, the emperor was easily persuaded that Li Su and his son should be investigated. 
Unable to see the emperor, Li Su wrote a memorial warning that Zhao Gao's power was dangerous. However, the young emperor trusted his longtime tutor and had Li Su arrested instead. Zhao Gao had Li Su beaten until he confessed. In a letter to the emperor, Li Su listed his crimes as helping his king to annex all six states and become emperor, driving out our barbarians, honoring loyal ministers, standardizing measures and ordinances, constructing roads and pleasure parks, and relaxing penalties and lessening taxes. When the emperor sent someone to question him, Li Su refused to speak because he thought he was like the others who had examined him. Li Su's son had been killed by the rebels, but Zhao Gao falsified the report to make it look like he was a traitor. Finally, Li Su underwent the most severe punishment of the five mutilations, and his body was cut in two in the marketplace. All his relatives were also executed. Zhao Gao was made chancellor. Zhang Han, losing battles against the fighters of Chu, sent the chief official to the capital for instructions. But Zhao Gao refused to see him or believe him. Learning that Zhao Gao was controlling the government and that he would be executed whether he won in battle or not, Zhang Han and others surrendered their armies to the leaders of the states. To test the ministers, Zhao Gao had a deer presented to the emperor, but said it was a horse. The emperor laughed at his chancellor, calling a deer a horse, and then asked his courtiers. Some who wanted to please Zhao Gao said it was a horse, and Zhao Gao made sure that those who said it was a deer were charged with crimes. When Zhao Gao realized that the former states had set up kings and were defeating the Qin forces, he was afraid he would be punished for misleading the emperor about the seriousness of the problem. So, with his son-in-law, he staged a fake rebel attack on the palace, killed 30 or 40 guards, and forced the second emperor to commit suicide. When the one eunuch who had remained loyal to the emperor was asked by the emperor why he did not warn him sooner, he replied that if he had dared to speak, he would have been put to death long before. Zhao Gao summoned all the officials and the royal family to inform them he had punished the second emperor. Then he set up Zhu Ying, son of an older brother of the second emperor, as king of Jin, since the six independent states would have made the title of emperor a mockery. Afraid he would be put to death in the temple, Zhu Ying waited for Zhao Gao to come get him where he was fasting. Then Zhu Ying stabbed and killed Zhao Gao and had his relatives executed. After 46 days, the Qin armies were defeated and Zhu Ying surrendered with a rope around his neck. Liu Ji, the governor of Pei, entered the capital without destroying it. But Xiang Yu came and burned the city, probably destroying more literature than the official burning of books. Zhu Ying and the rest of the royal family were executed. The Qin Empire was dead in 206 BC. Xiang Yu declared himself protector king of western Chu and divided the empire among various kings and marquises, making Liu Qi king of Han. A Confucian scholar named Jia Yi, who lived 201 to 169 BC, wrote of the faults of Jin. He observed that Qin's long military dominance was primarily due to its strategic geographical position in fertile Wei River Valley, surrounded by mountains and the Yellow River with only a narrow pass to defend. Although the people hoped for peace under the unified empire, he criticized the first emperor for being greedy and short-sighted and never trusting his officials nor getting to know the people. He cast aside the royal way by relying on private procedures outlawing writings, making laws and penalties harsh, putting deceit first and humanity and justice last, and leading the whole world in violence and cruelty. These methods may have worked temporarily in seizing an empire, but they did not work in preserving one. Similarly, Jia Yi argued that the second emperor might have been able to answer the people's hopes if he had cared for the nation's ills, corrected the first emperor's errors, apportioned the land to the people and fiefed worthy ministers set up states to order the empire with propriety, emptied the prisons, pardoned those condemned to death, 
abolished slavery and humiliating punishments, allowed people to return to their villages, opened the granaries, and dispersed funds to help orphans and the poor. Lightened taxes and labor requirements, simplified laws and reduced penalties, and allowed people to make a new beginning and practice integrity, presiding over the empire with authority and virtue. Then the people would have flocked to him. However, the Second Empire did not adopt these policies, but rather multiplied laws and made punishments harsher with unjust rewards and penalties and unlimited taxes and levies. Officials could not supervise all the tasks assigned, and people sank into poverty and destitution. Then villainy and deceit sprang up all around as superiors and inferiors turned on each other. The numbers of those accused of crimes grew, and everyone feared for their safety. Thus, people were easily aroused to violent rebellion. <laughs>